I want to introduce uh, Claire Doyle, who will be giving her seminar today. Um, Claire is from Ohio originally, and before joining the graduate program here at OU, she completed her bachelor's in meteorology from OU, graduating in 2022. Um, and during that time, she was involved in a lot of service things um, with OWL and um, a number of different undergraduate research projects, looking at some um, social science things and some convective simulations using CM1. Um, so today, Claire will be presenting results that um, will be part of her uh, master's thesis, um, looking at modeling interactions between turbulence and cloud microphysics in large eddy simulation um, using results from some direct numerical simulations. So Claire, take it away. Yeah, great. Thank you, Scott. So uh, as Scott said, um, I'm going to be looking at modeling the effects of specifically uh, supersaturation fluctuations in large eddy simulations. So you may be asking yourself, what does turbulence, especially on small scales, have to do um, with my area of research? Well, clouds have a significant impact on Earth's climatological and hydrological systems. Climatologically, they impact Earth's radiative budget. Um, as we know, clouds have a higher albedo than the dark Earth's surface, and therefore it reflects more radiation back. They also have considerable uncertainties um, in climate models and predicting uh, climate change and those are some of the largest sources of uncertainty. So in addition, uh, hydro, they impact the hydrological system. Um, they, clouds provide precipitation, which is great in droughts and not so great when we have extreme precipitation events. So if we can't accurately predict the clouds and um, modeling them, then we can't really predict what's going to happen with some of these precipitation events or what's going to happen in the larger climatological scale processes. Um, so as I noted, precipitation is a huge uh, uncertainty in the process. And so we can characterize uh, precipitation into two processes, warm rain and cold rain. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of us should have had this from undergrad, but just as a quick refresher, the warm rain process is when there are all liquid water particles. There are no ice particles, and the cold rain process does have the presence of ice particles. Um, this study will particularly investigate the warm rain process and warm clouds because collision coalescence is one of the processes that remains poorly understood. Um, and this is where you get a few anomalously large droplets that then can start to combine and collect together and then fall as rain. So we want to focus on those types of processes. So one area of research that has begun to look at what could cause collision coalescence is the role that turbulence plays on supersaturation fluctuations. Um, this also can impact the distribution of cloud condensation nuclei and generate these preferential growth zones where particles can grow to be larger and you can get those anomalously large particles as compared to just a standard, you know, updraft or whatever. So this is great. And this could be a, a good hypothesis. However, studying this process is a challenge because you, you know, on one side have processes like entrainment and mixing, which is occurring at large scales. And then you also have these small microphysical processes, which are, are occurring on sometimes a millimeter scale. And so this is really difficult to sample in the real atmosphere. Generally, when we're thinking of atmospheric studies, um, you think of planes that fly through clouds with their probes and they collect data, and this is really great. However, this doesn't allow you to sample, you don't get information on the ambient environment, and you only get a limited amount of data from those specific transects that you've done. So, in this study, we want to look at uh, a variety of approaches with controlled environments. Um, so this would include the pie chamber at Michigan Tech, um, direct numerical simulations, as well as large eddy simulations. 
So first, we're going to take a look at the Pi Chamber. Uh, like I said, this is a laboratory chamber at Michigan Technological University. It is called the Pi Chamber because it has a volume of 3.14 meters cubed, and it is characterized by a warm plate at the bottom and a cool plate at the top. And then these temperature differences initiate Rayleigh-Bernard convection. If you're not familiar with that, I'll come back to that and, and give a little bit more um, information on that in just one minute. But another benefit of the chamber is that you can inject aerosols in to support cloud droplet activation. So the Pi Chamber is great because we can control our environment, we can collect data. However, that data that we're collecting is really only coming from the point where our sensors are. If you know, you're only collecting at those specific points. And so you're only getting this Eulerian perspective from a few fixed places in the chamber. And you're not getting a Lagrangian perspective, which follows some of the particles to see the droplet growth history and things like that. Now, recent um, advancements have allowed for some Lagrangian particles and, and information to be tracked, but really that's only your vertical velocities or things like that. That's not your uh, cloud microphysics information that we're really interested in, like temperature and humidity and supersaturation. So this is something that we'll have to keep in mind. Going back to the Rayleigh-Bernard convection, this is characterized by a large scale updraft on one side of the pie chamber. You can see that on the left plot. Um, and then it's also characterized by a downdraft on the other side. And so you get this circular motion um, going on. And then as uh, simulate, not simulations, but as studies are conducted, this large scale circulation oscillates right and left within the chamber. Now, this large scale is great. This gives us a lot of interesting information. However, there are some smaller scale fluctuations within that large scale flow, and that's really what we're interested in. So this takes us back to our point that, OK, we're only getting those fluctuations from a couple of places. Despite this, though, we can still get some good results from the pie chamber. Um, several studies have found that temperature and supersaturation fluctuations were related to an increase in the number of cloud droplets. Um, and another study observed activated cloud droplets in both sub, uh, unsaturated and saturated conditions. And this is really important because this suggests that there are fluctuations that are above saturation leading to activation of cloud droplets even when your ambient environment is unsaturated. So we keep hitting at this point that this is all great. We're getting data, we're getting information, but it's very spatially limited, which takes us to numerical models. Uh, there are two primary methods of numerical models that are present in studying these uh, turbulent processes in cloud physics. Um, and those are direct numerical simulations and large eddy simulations, DNS and LES. DNS is great. It is able to model all scales of motion down to the dissipative scales, which are on the order of a millimeter, so quite small. However, because you're fully resolving that, this is very computationally expensive and it limits the maximum Reynolds number that you can achieve in a given study. But on the other hand, we have LES, which resolves the large scale eddies and then uses some subgrid, subgrid scale models to represent the smaller scales. This allows it to, meet, to be more computationally efficient and allows for more higher Reynolds number flows. Um, just as a quick note for those who may not be familiar with Reynolds number, this is just a measure of how turbulent or laminar a flow is. Um, in the boundary layer, this would be on the order of about 10 to the ninth. But in the DNS that we're working with, the max Reynolds number is about 10 to the fourth. So there's quite a big difference between what we can model in DNS versus what we actually see in the atmosphere, which warrants the use of this LES. 
But like we said, this, the smaller scales need to be modeled in LES. And so you have to make sure you're maintaining accuracy when you're doing so. But before we get to that, we should take a look at some results from direct numerical simulations. Um, recent studies have conducted experiments looking at simulations of the pie chamber, and those support some of the studies that the actual pie chamber found. Um, they found supersaturation fluctuations are dependent on spatial scales of turbulent flows. And then this can lead to a process called large eddy hopping or eddy hopping, which influences the droplet growth history. And droplet growth history is really important to understanding because a particle that's been activated previously has more likelihood of becoming activated again. So fully understanding where the particle has been and where it's going and what can influence what's going to happen with it. Um, in addition, the DNS produced similar results to the pie chamber, but it did have some differences in their supersaturation fluctuation distributions. Um, but much like the pie chamber, there were periods of act droplet activation and deactivation. Um, one thing to note with this DNS is, again, just that the Reynolds number still remains relatively low or rather low compared to what's actually seen in the pie chamber. And so that is a limitation of the DNS because of its computational expense. So what can we do here? We've said DNS is too expensive, laboratory and observational research is limited spatially. So that really takes us to LES and leaves us with LES. Um, where you can get the higher Reynolds number flows with more computational efficiency, but we have to model those small scale processes. Being able to model those small scale processes is really this, the, the source of the problem though, because you have to accurately model those. Um, as we see with large eddy hopping, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but that's, I think, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but I should have. Uh, it's where you have a particle that is in this smaller scale eddy that then gets transferred to a larger eddy. And that's an important process, especially when we're considering LES, because if you're not fully or accurately resolving the small scales, you're not going to get accurate transfer of those particles to the large scale eddies um, that we do resolve. So, there are current um, subgrid scale models that can portray results that align with other studies, but this may not be for accurate physical reasoning. So we wanna take a look into this, um, especially from the cloud physics side, because subgrid scale models for momentum and scalar fluxes has been an area of research um, for several years, and they're doing a, a bit better on those, but really focusing on the cloud physics subgrid, cloud physics subgrid scale terms is a, an area of research that is certainly still ongoing. So we're going to take a look at that. Um, this study in particular is going to focus on the supersaturation variance, and that is important in the Lagrangian-based microphysics schemes. Um, this can influence the condensational growth of cloud droplets, and so that is why it is so important. Um, you can see here that supersaturation variance is on the left-hand side of the equation, and the, the first equation, and that is composed of two terms, your S prime squared term and your tau SS term. Your S prime squared term is the resolved, the resolved part of the supersaturation variance. And so um, that is what you're actually resolving in LES, while the tau sub SS is a term that we're going to have to model. And so we want to investigate how we can better model the tau sub SS term in the subgrid scales for LES. So how are we going to do that? Um, well, we have been provided DNS of the pie chamber from Dr. David Richter at the University of Notre Dame. Um, we are going to take that, run some simulations, and then we can solve for the resolved and the subgrid scale supersaturation variance. Once we have those, we can then go on to calculate two new models for the subgrid scale terms. That's going to be the similarity model and the gradient model. And then we'll conduct statistical analysis on those uh, and compare the true subgrid scale to the modeled. 
This is going to be important. Um, conducting the statistical analysis will help us identify the best model to use. Um, but when we go to implement down the line, going to implement this into LES, you're really going to have to weigh computational efficiency of whatever model you choose. So getting into a little bit more detail of the DNS that were provided, and I did want to note that these methods follow with Macmillan at all 2022. Uh, we have a domain size of two meter, two meter by one meter, and grid spacing of 128 cubed. Uh, an important thing to note is that we have periodic boundary conditions in the horizontal while we have the solid walls in the vertical direction. In the physical pie chamber, um, the side walls act as a humidity sink, and so condensation forms on them and decreases the humidity in the chamber. And without the periodic boundary conditions in the horizontal to act as that humidity sink, we would see supersaturations of about 20% in the DNS. And that's not physical, and we certainly want something that's more on the order of 2 to 3% supersaturation. So that's why that is um, the periodic boundary conditions are considered. We also have, just like the pie chamber, we have the warm temperature at the bottom and the cold temperature at the top to initiate Rayleigh-Bernard convection. And then for this, uh, this study and this overview, I'll be looking at 500 seconds, um, just the one time step. And then that uh, corresponds to, all of this corresponds to a Rayleigh number of about 10 to the sixth. Uh, we introduced Reynolds number a little bit ago. We can also talk about Rayleigh number. This is proportional to Reynolds number, and it's just another measure of comparing the um, turbul turbulence versus laminar flow. We also getting into a little bit more detail about what we're looking at and, and what kind of data we get from the DNS. Uh, we get both Eulerian and Lagrangian perspectives. The Eulerian uh, solves the Navier-Stokes equation for momentum, as well as both scalar advection diffusion equations for temperature and humidity. And then our Lagrangian particles, we have a super droplet scheme where one particle represents an ensemble of particles. And so from this, we can uh, inject the particles into the DNS with a multiplicity, which is just the number that corresponds to how many particles one particle represents. So for this case, uh, we've simulated a number of injection rates, um, but throughout the remainder of the study, we'll be focusing on the one per centimeter cubed per minute case. So taking a look uh, a little bit further into the details of the temperature profile for the DNS, like I said, we have that warm plate at the bottom and the cool plate at the top. And then both of those create like a boundary layer feature that is in the near the top and bottom walls. And then we're well mixed throughout the middle of the simulation, this middle of the, do the domain, excuse me. Um, and so I also wanted to point out that um, for this study, we wanted to consider those boundary layers. And so uh, I've picked out three heights, one at the bottom, which is at 0.1 meter, one in the middle is at 0.5 meter, and then one at the top, which is at 0.9. And we can convert those to dimensionless terms to talk about them more. Um, and so that's the H over delta, um, 64 for 0.1, 32 for 0.5, and then 57.6 for the 0.9. And so these are really what we're going to be looking at for the remainder of the study. So taking a look at some temperature, you have temperature here on the left and vertical velocity on the right. Um, and these are at the, the lower, middle, and top. And uh, you can see the warm temperature there on the, on, um, the left plot where you have the, that warm surface and then relatively cooler temperatures there at the top. And you do get pretty well mixed um, throughout the middle. But one thing that we can see in the vertical velocities on the right is that Rayleigh-Bernard convection where you have that warm updraft on the left-hand side and then the cool downdraft on the right. And so now we wanna take a look further into specifically the supersaturation variance. Like we talked about, this was something that 
has fluctuations that is really important in understanding so that we can find out where there potentially could be preferential growth zones. So to do this, uh, once we get our data, we're going to filter it with a 2D Gaussian filter. Uh, we did this at 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64 filter widths. And then from our filtered quantities, we can get the resolved terms and the subgrid scale terms um, that we will need to model. So taking a look, this is just at um, 0.5 meter. So right in the middle of the chamber, you're looking uh, top down as, as a horizontal, the horizontal plane. Um, and you can see that these supersaturations do with increasing filter width do get, get smeared out and, and not as much uh, detail. With the smaller filter widths, you maintain a lot of that detail that um, you had. It, it looks like um, very similar to what the unfiltered data looks like. But by the time you get to 64, it, everything, it's, it's hard to really decipher any um, distinct, distinct uh, features. So that's just something to uh, look at, kind of get an idea of what the filter widths look at, look like. Um, and continuing to look at this is a subgrid scale fraction. And so this is really the fraction of how much is in the resolved model versus how much is, is being um, modeled, how much is resolved versus how much is being modeled. And you can see on the left-hand side, this is also with height. And so on the left-hand side, you don't, you're, you don't have a lot that is actually being resolved. A lot of, well, you, have, you do have a lot that is being resolved. There's not a lot that's being modeled. Whereas if you go to the far right, you have a lot that's being modeled because the majority of everything is in the subgrid scale. And so the other thing that I wanted to point out with this plot is that this is not consistent with height. This is not something that, um, you know, we do have this height dependency. And not only that, but it's not symmetric. Um, when you look at this bottom boundary as opposed to the top, they are not the same. And so that's why we wanted to look at those boundaries in particular um, at the different heights as well as in the middle because we don't see the same trends throughout. So as we continue on, um, we'll be looking at three filter widths. This is just because doing uh, six was quite a task. And so I tried to pick three, um, one that really resolved a lot, one that was kind of in the middle, and then one that modeled quite a bit. And so you can see those three that we'll be working with throughout the remainder of the study. So that takes us to our modeled terms. So we have the true and we have the true uh, subgrid scale term. And now we want to figure out how to model that and how to best model that. And so we're going to start with first our similarity model. And to do that, we are going to filter again over new filter widths. Um, and those were then 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128. And then that will give us our similarity model. We can also take a look at the gradient model, uh, which has finite differencing in the vertical directions, while derivatives in spectral space in the horizontal. Um, again, the horizontal derivatives being taken, being taken in spectral space is because we do have those pseudo-spectral walls. And so this would just be really difficult to take um, derivatives finite differencing or centered finite differencing um, in, in those uh, horizontal domains. So let's take a look at some probability density functions of what we get. Um, here we have the subgrid scale variance, supersaturation variance of the true subgrid scale term, the uh, similarity model, and the gradient model. Um, the Similarity model is like the medium blue, the gradient model is the dark blue, and the light blue is the true subgrid scale variance. Um, and then again, we have that at the lower, middle, and upper height. Um, one thing to point out is this gradient model, well, throughout all three of these, there really is this exp exponential decay. Um, the 
the models seem to be the closest together in the middle and the top boundary, uh, whereas the bottom doesn't have quite as high of peaks and it's a little bit uh, longer tails. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out is that the x-axes are not necessarily equal. So in the middle, we have from zero to one, whereas um, in the bottom and the top, those ones are zero to two. Um, this is likely because we don't have as much variance in the middle where everything is well mixed. And this is going to be something that is true for the others, that the, the, the other uh, PDFs, they don't have... Um, the variance in the middle of the chamber is much smaller than those on the two boundaries. So then taking a look at a wider filter width, this is filter width eight. Um, again, light blue is the true, the medium blue is the similarity model and the dark blue is the gradient model. And this is where we start to see some differences <laughs> between the two models. Um, this, the similarity model seems to follow the general trends of those in the gradient model or of the true subgrid scale term, while the gradient model still maintains that exponential decay. Um, in, in this case, um, the domains are much larger. There is more variance here. I think just because you're filtering over uh, larger scales, you're getting more variance across that. And then finally, looking at the largest filter width, and this is where we lose a lot of skill. Um, and it's really hard to make um, meaningful comparisons between them. I think because what's going on here is we have, we're starting to get influences from the large scale, the large scale circulation. Um, and so you get these two peaks that could be from the, you know, updraft and downdraft on one side. And that's really my intuition for these, but still we see that the similarity model is picking up the general trends better than the gradient model is. So we've kind of pointed out that the gradient model doesn't always do a great job. The similarity model follows the trend better, but I wanted to look at this more closely with correlation coefficients. And this was very evident with correlation coefficients. Um, here we have them plotted with height where your similarity model is on the left and your gradient model is on the right. Um, that's a correlation between the two, true subgrid scale term and then the modeled. Um, and our similarity model has correlation coefficients between 0.8 and 0.1. So it performs relatively well as compared to the gradient model, which has correlation coefficients generally between 0.2 and 0.5. So that is quite a big difference. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out with particularly with the similarity model, is that you have, um, it, it appears that there's more correlation between the larger filter widths. And again, I think that that's probably because you're filtering over such a large scale. Um, a, a filter width of size 32 is about a quarter of your domain. And so you're just filtering over such a large scale that um, it's, it's, yeah, you're getting the, those large scale features. And so that's going to um, influence the results. So in conclusion, uh, the similarity model appears to be a better fit for the true subgrid scale term. Uh, it had higher correlation. Those trends were also identified in the, um, in the PDFs. Uh, but we also do find here that there is some suggestion that we can filter too much and then we're getting the large scale circulation and that becomes apparent and we're not really that. We wanna know what the small scale turbulent features are showing. So this is definitely something that we're going to have to continue to look into um, with, with the future works. So with that, we plan to compare across the other injection rate cases. Um, we also want to look at some other subgrid scale terms. Um, these could these include um, concentration with supersaturation, um, supersaturation, and your particle size, and then also your particle size and binning the, the particle size in different ways. And so um, those are going to be some more interesting things that we can look at. Uh, we also do plan to run additional simulations 
to push the, the Rayleigh number here in this case, um, we have an allocation on derecho to run up to 1024. So we hope to get those going soon. Um, and that should really help us get a wider range of filter widths, as well as additional particles to help in better statistical convergence. So that's all I have. I do want to uh, have a couple quick acknowledgements just for Scott, uh, thank, thanking him for all of his mentorship and help and assistance. Um, Brian Green, I think I saw him on here before I started. Brian's been super helpful um, in helping with code and, and interpretation of stuff. Um, my office mates and the rest of the graduate cohort, uh, everybody is just so supportive and encouraging and helpful. And um, I've really enjoyed spending time with them. And of course my dog Desi, cause she really does the emotional support <laughs> lifting, <laughs> heavy lifting there. But yeah, I would be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Also online. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I have uh, two questions actually. Sure. Yeah, one more, more simple. Uh, so uh, you mentioned uh, DNS generally tends to fall to the general number, and then you mentioned the Rayleigh number, Rayleigh number of your simulation. What's the Reynolds number of the year DNS? Is that tends to fall? Um, you know, Scott has done some comparisons of these. Um, I don't, I think he said that the maximum Reynolds number that we could achieve in these simulations would be about 10 to the sixth once we get up to the 1024. Um, but I think that it's a little bit lower, or I'm sorry, Rayleigh number for 10 to the 1024 should be up to 10 to the, hold on, I'm sorry. You asked for Reynolds number. Yeah. Reynolds number, yes, 10 to the sixth for, um, the uh the, the bigger simulations i'm not exactly sure 100 percent what these ones were but yeah my question was along this line because i understand right you are more trying to simulate the chamber and not really the cloud the real cloud mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my question what's the real number of the chamber because i think it's much smaller than the cloud you, you are probably not very far from the real number of the chamber yeah, that's probably very true. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my hand what the Reynolds number of the chamber is, but I would be happy to look into that and get back to you. you. The Reynolds number you have the left scale, and the left scale of the chamber is maybe three orders of the smaller than the cloud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I completely agree. Yeah. Then, then the other question this is more, uh, maybe I didn't get it right, but uh, what? what you are trying to get the, uh, the subgrid of super saturation. Mm -hmm. uh, why, do, why does that go? The subgrid variability of super saturation. I, I will explain why. Because super saturation, if I understand right, is the excess over saturation, mm -hmm. which is dependent on temperature and humidity. Mm -hmm. But then you have prognostic equations for temperature and humidity, which each has subgrid parameterizations. Mm -hmm. Uh, wouldn't that cover the subgrid of uh, super saturation? Um, I I'm not a hundred percent sure. I I think because we have these terms, um, they matter more in the Lagrangian perspective of things. Mm -hmm. That it's when you're following those Lagrangian perspectives that it. The supersaturation becomes more. Um, so the models actually add some grid supersaturation to the to the values for for automation. That would be my my, my question. You yeah, need, you need to account for that on top on the subgrid variability or subgrid terms of temperature and humidity. You have a that's pretty interesting. Yeah, sure. I think that's definitely something that I haven't thought too deeply on, but I would definitely like to talk to Scott about that more and come up with a good answer for that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. If there aren't any other questions, I'm sure there are some anxious people in the room to get their cards. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
thank you guys for coming out um on us of your day so i really appreciate it i'm sure claire really appreciates it yeah, thank you and thank you claire thank you